I was seven years old. I actually have a vivid memory of that. And it was like Jesus tugging on my heart. I knew that I'm going to follow him. He's the savior. I believe in him. And I made that expression of faith to my parents and to the pastor of the church. This is In Good Faith, where it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. This week on In Good Faith, if I had to give a title to this, and why, I guess I can. I'm the host. The title <laughs> I'm going to give to our explorations today, these two different interviews, is Shaking Up What We Think We Already Know. With me in studio is senior producer Heather Bigley. Hello. And student producers Leah King. Hello. And Emma Engebretson. Hi. So what about shaking things up? Here's one of my favorite moments when I take groups to Israel is we are looking at a stone trough carved out. And I said, there's the manger. And everyone's thinking, no, no, I've seen the paintings of the little wooden thing with the cross beams and little three bites of hay in it for the donkey. And there's not enough wood in the Middle East to waste on making things for animals. You carve a trough, then you can use it forever. And that's most likely what the baby Jesus was put in. But I have people who still are scratching their heads and it's fun to start our journey that way. Don't expect that everything you've got in your head is exactly the way it is. And that's what happens with our guests today. And we start off with Dr. Elizabeth Poltzer, who has just graduated from Duke University with her PhD. And she begins her position soon as Assistant Professor of New Testament at Villanova this fall. Her studies focus on textual criticism, Mary Magdalene, and the Gospel of John. And by the way, as a master's student, she got her analysis of this thing we're going to talk about in the book of John published in the Harvard Theological Review. Yeah, so part of Elizabeth's story is this amazing research that she does that she brings to the attention of scholars, one who thought, oh, we've kind of done all the work in that area, haven't we? And then is able to make it accessible to the rest of us. I love how she just talked about how there's always more to be found. And that kind of goes off of what you said, Steve, just about how when you shake things up, you're able to find more because things are are moved around and what you typically see on the surface is maybe in a different position. Because sometimes we think we know it all, just uh, like Heather said, and so we're not even looking. Scholars weren't looking because this quote had been done already, unquote. I like how she talked about the divine feminine. You'll hear how she goes into her childhood and her upbringing and how something that she found that she was lacking growing up, she really dove into in her adulthood. And she's going to kick this off sharing a story. And I'm not going to share the answer to this prayer, but it is an answer to a prayer that sets her life on a whole different course. Well, that is certainly a strange story, probably the strangest story of my life. I had been in the music business for about 12 years. When I graduated from college, I was in a band and we won a big contest. We got to tour with artists like Jewel and Mm. Poe, and we got a demo deal with Atlantic Records. And I pursued that for quite a while. And I noticed that the music business sort of had diminishing returns. I did put out several albums. My artist name is Libby Schrader, if you want to look it up. I felt like I had to keep doing it, even though it wasn't sort of paying off the way that I had hoped that it would. And it was around 2010 that I had recently learned how to pray the rosary. I was raised in the Episcopal Church, but Mm -hmm. I was interested in the rosary. And um, around the corner from where I lived in Brooklyn, New York, there was a really beautiful garden dedicated to the Virgin Mary attached to a Catholic church. And there was one day that I went there to pray and I heard words in response, which was very strange because I don't usually hear words in a prayer. I just pray like most people do. And the words were in English and the words were, maybe you should talk to Mary Magdalene about that. Wow. <laughs> and I, I was like, what? You know, when you're praying, you maybe have your own ideas about what's going on or your own assumptions. And when something comes from out of nowhere that just doesn't 
it's just something I never would have thought of. That's not where I was going. I My response was, where did that come from? And so I left the garden and I just kind of was walking home and I was like, hmm, I went to the garden of the Holy Virgin and I asked for the blessing of the Magdalene. And I was like, oh, that's that could be good. And so I went home and I just started writing a song and it came so fast and so easy. It took me maybe two days to write it. And I was like, oh gosh, now I've written a song about Mary Magdalene. That's strange. I, I'm i a sort of like a pop rock singer songwriter and it's not like I'm a Christian artist. And so it was strange that I'd written this random song about a Christian saint. And as I thought to myself, well, I can't, you know, write a song about Mary Magdalene and not know anything about her. I had grown up going to church in the Episcopal Church. I guess at that time we're interested in the Virgin Mary because I had been starting to pray the rosary. But I said, you know, if if I'm going to write a song about Mary Magdalene, I need to go find out about her. So I walked over to the Brooklyn Public Library and I I found the complete idiot's guide to Mary Magdalene. <laughs> <laughs> and I checked it out. And it was really good. It's actually really good. And I said, I need to dig a little bit deeper. And somewhere along the way, you know, I found out from that Complete Idiot's Guide that, you know, Mary Magdalene had been sort of a controversial character. And of course, that she's most prominent in the Gospel of John. And also, this is important that some people had always debated whether she was the same person as Mary of Bethany, um, the sister of Lazarus who anoints Jesus in John's Gospel. And and so so Mary and Martha, the sisters with as well. Yes. Um, Yes. That's, that's uh, what I was interested in. And so I, um, I said, you know, I want to look at the world's oldest manuscript of the gospel of John, just because I was curious. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe there's something in that manuscript that was changed or that scholars have overlooked. But what happened was that through a friend of a friend, I was able to meet with a scholar of New Testament at General Theological Seminary in Manhattan. Her name is Deirdre Good. And I said, I want to look at Papyrus 66 because the internet had told me that that's the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John. And And I said, how do I look at that? Is this a Greek manuscript? It is. Yeah. It's a codex um, and it's like the whole Gospel of John. It's not bound up with other Gospels. And so she sent me a link to a website that had a transcription of Papyrus 66. Um, And I should say that Papyrus 66 is usually dated to the turn of the third century, like around 200 AD. And so that's later than the gospel was written, at least a century after the actual gospel was written. But this is the oldest copy we have. So it's a copy of copy of another copy that goes back, you know, it's the closest we can get to the autograph of John as far as time is concerned. But there were still several steps in between the authorship of the gospel and this earliest copy. So um, I wanted to look at it. And so she sent me this transcription. And I basically, on my computer, I had one window open to this online transcription of Papyrus 66 with the corrections also like highlighted on it. Um, And then another window open to an interlinear Greek study Bible so that every single Greek word was translated for me in English because I didn't read Greek. And so I was like, okay, well, I just want to see if Papyrus 66 has anything funny around Mary Magdalene. This is my random question that I had. And as I'm looking at it, I go, of course, to John chapter 20, which is the encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And I'm in the garden and there's nothing strange there. And I'm like, okay, well, what about the cross? You know, Mary Magdalene, the cross, nothing strange there. And so I'm like, well, you know, the Complete Idiot's Guide told me that maybe, you know, some people thought that Lazarus's sister Mary was Mary Magdalene. So let me just look at John 11. And I said, whoa, because if you look at the transcription of John 11 in Papyrus 66, you see that there's about five verses where things are just really getting changed. Like you see the scribe making corrections. Mm. And as I said, I, I didn't read Greek, but I could see that the name Maria had been changed to Martha. So in Greek, the name Mary is Maria, and the I, which is like an iota, had been erased and changed to a theta, which in Greek is one letter, but it represents TH. So the change of the name Maria to Martha is just one letter in Greek. And then a couple of verses later, it looked like the name Maria had been completely scratched out 
and changed to say high Adelphi. I saw in the interlinear study Bible that high Adelphi means the sisters. So this woman's name was changed, like literally this woman has a name and it's erased and it's changed to say the sisters. And all these verbs in that verse are changed from singular to plural. So I just, I copied it and I sent it to the professor, Deirdre Good, and I, and the email had like a bunch of exclamation points. I'm like, look at this. It looks like they're adding Martha. That's what it looks like. The name Mary's changed to Martha and then it's an, it's a woman and then it turns into the sisters. I'm like, looks like they're adding Martha to the story. And she basically replied saying, very interesting. I was like, what? <laughs> Tell what? me more. What? <laughs> and I and I just didn't, I guess I didn't realize what the way that biblical scholarship works. Um, and basically Papyrus 66 was discovered, I think, in 1956 and published in 1958. It was discovered in Egypt. Um, and then it was quickly published. And then people commented on it in the 1960s. And Papyrus 66 is a unique manuscript and that the scribe makes 450 corrections to the text, which is kind of shocking since this is our oldest copy of the Gospel of John. So the scribe is correcting. And, as and they do copy. we know do we know the source of this papyrus, where it was found? Near Dishna, Egypt. Hmm. Um, so it's actually not too far away from where, if you've heard of the Gnostic Gospels, um, the Nag Hammadi corpus were found in a different set of jars, but very close by, like maybe within a day's walk. They were definitely two different finds in two different places, but that were close to one another. Um, so anyway, when I sent this to Deirdre, <laughs> she didn't seem to be surprised by it since it had been published and commented on 50 years previously. She probably assumed that all the work had been done. But... In fact, that was not the case. Um, I went back to the Brooklyn Public Library and I started ordering academic articles on interlibrary loan. This might have been a clue <laughs> that I was an academic at heart <laughs> because I didn't give up. I just kept digging and getting articles on interlibrary loan for fun. And then I found out that um, I found these articles and they said, yep, the name Mary's been changed to Martha. Yep, the name Mary's been crossed out and changed to the sisters. Yep, a woman's been split in two in this verse. That's the strangest change in the whole papyrus. So this is an intriguing story, like not one I've heard before, and I'm filled with questions. <laughs> so you notice this change and this possible one person being split into two. Yeah. Why? Why? What are possible reasons someone would do this in the translation process or in just record keeping and going over the manuscripts? Well, the first thing I want to underscore is that this isn't translation. Uh -huh. It's all in Greek. It's all in Greek. So it's the base text. It's that's maybe itself is getting altered. So, so they're because, in their yeah. own language making changes Correct. in the same language. And I'm saying even before it's translated, there yeah. are changes in the in the original language. There's changes being made. And so what I was, I, I had to think about this a lot. And I was saying, well, what does Martha do? in John's gospel, like what's her primary function in John's gospel? And her big moment is in John 11, verse 27. It's right after Jesus says this very famous quote, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? And people know that quote from Jesus, but they usually forget who he's talking to. And I'm saying there's a reason that you forget who he's talking to because he's talking to a forgettable character mm. and it's female. He's talking to a woman. And then she responds with what scholars of John have often argued is the central confession of this gospel. But again, people forget about her, which is strange if she's making such a big confession. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Again, people know those words, but don't necessarily remember who said them. And so I'm saying, okay, well, if Martha is the one saying this, what might she be there for? And in the course of my master's thesis, as I was writing it, I also looked at um, church fathers, people who were writing in the second, third, fourth centuries and what they said about the Gospel of John. And oddly, sometimes what they said about John does not match what your Bible will say. Mm. And interestingly enough, a church father, Tertullian, who wrote um, at the very beginning of the third century, 
In his treatise against Praxius, he says that Mary confessed Jesus as the son of God. And I was like, wait a second, hold on here. So what what would what would the Gospel of John be like if Mary confesses Jesus as the son of God? That means that the person who confesses him as the Christ is the same person who gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. Mm. So there's like a theological connection there. And also it means that she would confess him as the Christ, maybe serve the supper and then um, anoint him. And then if you think she's Mary Magdalene, then she's at the cross and she's the only person who goes to his empty tomb first. And then he's she's the first person that the risen Jesus appears to. And she's the first person who gets an apostolic commission. So this is, could be a version of John where Mary, who could be Mary Magdalene, is a central character throughout the entire gospel. And so why would you add Martha? Because it diminishes that. Mm. Instead of one woman doing all those things, it's those two nice sisters from Luke's gospel, Mary and Martha, plus Mary Magdalene. So it sort of dilutes her role and it makes it so that whoever confesses Jesus as the Christ does not receive an appearance of the risen Jesus. It sort of ensures that it's sort of compartmentalized and sort of, it sort of, um, it, it diminishes her potential power as a leader in the Christian movement. And so you could see that there may be a reasonable motive to add Martha to the story. You're listening to In Good Faith. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In Good Faith. So, but but one point that seems obvious is that you were at that time already a praying person. What oh, what, yes. what, what was your your upbringing like? Was that in a, a Christian home or a, a home of faith? I grew up in the Episcopal Church, yeah. And um, you know, we just grew up going to church like most mainline Protestants for most of my life. I would say I had a very active um, excellent youth group. It was just a really, really strong community for me growing up. If you have a fantastic youth group, church is fun. There was there was a lot of um, just sort of seeing how Christianity can work in the world in a really good way that I experienced. My faith journey, the more authentic and personal part of it, did begin in high school. I mean, I, I prayed a lot. I had a very active faith life. And I would think of it more in terms of just God, at that time. And I think that set a good foundation for just a fully positive church and prayer experience. I never was taught any shame in my tradition. I never got much guilt. Maybe some people don't like that about the Episcopal Church, but I there was not a lot of guilt or talk of hell or anything in, in my upbringing. It was just, God loves you. That's what I was told. God is love and God loves you. And so because of that, I did, yeah, I did sometimes pray and I had very strong experiences. And then as time went on, I did more meditation in my 20s and 30s. That was something that I was really interested in. And then I felt sort of pulled back toward, um, I mean, I, I had actually grown up in the Episcopal church and there was a Catholic church just like a block away. And this whole thing about the Virgin Mary, it's like, no, we don't do that in the Episcopal church. So I never grew up with any kind of anything to do with the Virgin Mary um, in my church growing up. But I think that at a certain point, I kind of was longing for some aspect of um, divine feminine in my experience. And interestingly, I think that's sort of what ended up interesting me, uh, making making me interested in the rosary. And I was taught um, by a Catholic woman how to pray the rosary. And it was around that time that I found that I, I guess I would say it feels like I met the Virgin Mary, <laughs> like as a, as a spiritual guide, maybe. And it's funny because I remember what it feels like to be a Protestant who has zero relationship to the Virgin Mary and who thinks that's weird. I vividly remember what that's like. And then I remember partly because of this garden encounter, like, it feels like I met her. And and now, like, I'm teaching a class uh, on the history of Christianity right now. And we were reading about um, Latin American traditions. And I was reading the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I was just reading an academic chapter. And I, like, shed a tear. Like, when I was, like, reading about um, Our Lady of Guadalupe's appearance to Juan Diego, I'm like, that's her, <laughs> you know? And so it, it sometimes when I have these distinct experiences 
where even though I'm not Catholic, but sometimes when Catholics talk about the Virgin Mary, I'm like, I know her. I know who you're talking. I know her too. I met her. And yeah, I would say that it was later in my 30s that I um, I had this sort of encounter with the Virgin Mary. And that has been a big part of my faith journey ever since. I don't usually hear voices though. <laughs> I was going to ask, that's, that's one way of perceiving direction or an answer. So you yes. are marrying to, uh, no pun intended, to uh, <laughs> the academic study of ancient manuscripts and understanding along with your own personal spiritual experience. And I'm wondering yes. for people who are people of faith or have a belief, what, how do we benefit from having new or more accurate understandings of these ancient texts that have become our, our, our guides for our spiritual lives? Um, well, I think that they, there's always more to be found. There's always more to be found. And the thing about these ancient manuscripts and about the Gospels is that even in the text itself, there's so many different manuscripts, and sometimes they say different things. And it's really modern scholars who choose which readings to follow. And um, the thing is, is that even in the transmission of the text, humans always had a hand in it. And I think that what's what's really important is that you can't just have one particular demographic have complete control over the text. So traditionally, it has been sort of elite white males who have had complete control over the biblical text, partly in the copying, but also in the selection of which readings have made it into critical editions. It's a testament to the importance of diversity in scholarship, because what we take for granted as our biblical text is actually the product of committees of modern people who oftentimes all look the same way and make a decision about which readings to highlight and which to discard. And the critical edition has come up with that way in Greek when it comes to the New Testament, and that gets translated into your Bibles. So if different eyes go on it, you might see different things. And you could say it's about accuracy, but you could also say that it's about multiplicity, that there are are multiple readings happening of the gospel as far back as you can trace it. And you cannot always arrive at what the evangelist wrote because there's usually at least 100 years in between the authorship and the oldest surviving copy. So when your oldest surviving copies differ from one another, how do you adjudicate between the different readings? And I guess what I would just love for your um, listeners to know about is that there is there are choices. There's and and to some extent, picking one reading or another is subjective. Um, not not that training doesn't matter. Training and I have gotten trained since you know since I was a songwriter who found a change in a papyrus. I now have a doctorate uh, in uh, in my dissertation is on the subject of textual criticism, and I've had some of the best text critics in the world on my committee. So I've been trained now, but um, but at the same time, I it's really clear to me that it's always to some extent subjective when you have differing readings, which one gets highlighted and printed in the Bible, and um, sometimes when you have a different perspective with like I don't know a woman's viewpoint, <laughs> you might see. A different, oh, a different you mean, reading as you important. Mean, you mean fifty percent of humanity? <laughs> yes, fifty percent <laughs> of humanity. Might be interesting. <laughs> so, if you could have just a little sit down <laughs> with Mary Magdalene, what would you ask to get to the bottom of this? Oh my gosh, what would I ask Mary Magdalene? Did you ever know someone named Martha? Martha's definitely belongs in the Gospels, just maybe not in John. So how has this research impacted your faith or how has, and maybe you've hinted at this, how has God surprised you in this whole journey? Well, certainly the biggest surprise for me was to find out that I'm a text critic. You know, I thought I was a musician. That was my identity. I mean, I was a singer songwriter and I taught piano in my thirties. And then to find out that there's this weird part of my brain that looks at manuscripts and does exegesis and to find out that I'm pretty good at it. Like now I have a PhD from Duke. 
whoa, and now I'm going to be a professor of New Testament? The whole thing is just, it's wild. God surprised me by basically showing me a path that actually has been more, far more generative for me than the music business was. And it really feels as though there was maybe a sort of intervention into my life trajectory that set me on a totally different path that is very life-giving for me. So that was Dr. Elizabeth Pulser from Duke University, about to go to Villanova uh, to start her academic career. And as a former academic, I love that God led her into academia. This idea that she thought she had everything decided, she knew where she was headed, And then through a prayer and through some research, uh, God awakens within her this whole curiosity and um, it leads her on a completely different path that she could have never foreseen. Things that I'm really happy about are, one, that I know there's a book in the world called Idiot's Guide to Mary Magdalene. (laughs) I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to check that out really soon. And second of all, that, that... when she's asking in this prayer, the answer that she gets that she actually hears in her head is, well, maybe you should ask Mary Magdalene about that. So here's my chance to to poll the rest of the panel here about this whole idea of a need for a lack of and a search for the divine feminine in spirituality today. Yeah, I think it's important because a lot of the characters in scripture are male. All 12 apostles are male. And so as a woman, sometimes you can't put yourself into the story when there's not a feminine figure. Mary Magdalene is a figure who is almost an apostle and she's following Jesus. She's a disciple. And I think it's just encouraging that we have a woman studying a woman and we can learn from both of them the importance of women in scripture. Mm. Yeah. Honestly, it wasn't until maybe like two or three years ago that I sort of thought about more of like the divine feminine. And I think it was just partially because I had like good, strong women in my life. I actually lost my mom a few years ago. And that's what really made me think about like the comfort and the wisdom and different mm. things that that women have, the gifts that they have to offer. And I just like that she is building off of that. You know, she says that I know her too. I know Mary too. And she wants us to come to know these figures in history. This is what I've heard scholar Dan McClellan, who's a previous guest on In Good Faith, what he has called, the Bible is not univocal. We sometimes think it all agrees with itself. It says one thing and it never varies from that. But just there are different voices being expressed by different people. And even what we have, every translation, and even within, as we just heard with Elizabeth Pulser, even within the same language, changes being made by individuals or committees It's actually kind of miraculous what ended up even getting to us in our present day. So can we just shake the box up a little (laughs) bit more with our next guest? I knew from the moment I saw this book on the shelf that we had to talk to Dr. Craig Evans. He's a well-known New Testament scholar. He's taught and lectured throughout North America and the world. More than 90 books, hundreds of academic articles, and frequently served as an expert speaker and consultant on television programs and documentaries. And he has this book called From Jesus to Church. And when I saw that, I realized what he was getting at, which was, did Jesus actually set up a church? I mean, there was a church that resulted, but was that his intent? And he pretty much says no. Yeah, scholars immediately know that Jesus doesn't intend to found something that's outside of Israel. But lay people typically think, what are you talking about? He started the church. Isn't that why he came? Isn't that what he was doing, was to start a church? No, actually, uh, it's a prophetic movement within Israel, and it's in fulfillment of ancient prophecy, promises made to the patriarchs about things that are supposed to happen involving Israel and, of course, beyond Israel, impacting people outside of Israel, Gentiles, as they're usually called. And it's a, call it a revival movement if you want, a restoration movement, perhaps it's better, that's taking place within Israel itself. And I think the historical Jesus, not just the evangelist interpreting Jesus later, but the historical Jesus himself sees Gentiles coming in. It's all part of it. He alludes to Isaiah 56, 
which is an oracle about that prayer dedication. And this is when Jesus is in the temple precincts. And he says, is this house not a house of prayer for all the nations? You've made it a cave of robbers. And so Jesus is, I think he's saying that's, you've blown it. You haven't done what you're supposed to do. And so Jesus, I believe, saw himself as fulfillment of prophecy, as God's son calling the nation back to God's ways. And it will result in this, I think, a a wonderful eschatological period of time where Israel will be blessed. And that will mean including Gentiles in the people of God. And that's what he's talking about, I think, in Matthew when he calls, refers to his kahal, his congregation, his assembly, made up of ethnic Jews, genetic descendants of Abraham, but also made up of people who respond in faith, people who are Gentiles and join his kahal. And someday with mission fulfilled, all Israel will be saved, as Paul says in Romans 11. And that's when the kingdom of God on earth will have come in its fullness. So I think that's what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't say, oh, I'm here to start the Protestant church. I'm here to, you know, so there'll be the buildings will look a little different from synagogues. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But that is, of course, in the course of history, that is what in part happens. So it's an interesting idea to picture these first followers of Jesus. We could call them Christians, although they didn't yet call themselves that. And they're going to synagogue every week. That's correct. That's right. Jesus is brother James, and he's writing a letter to the scattered, the diaspora. And he talks about now when someone who's poor comes into your synagogue. And so it never would occur to him to think that's the wrong word to use. He doesn't say when they come into your church. And I think that's because when James is writing, this is so early, synagogue just means gathering place. Ecclesia means the same thing, a group of people that have been called out to assemble. And so the technical terminology to which we are accustomed That terminology is understood and finalized later. And so it's anachronistic to start taking our definitions and our architecture and our practices and things and start reading them back into the the first generation. The first generation thought of itself, this is a revitalized, reformed, redeemed Israel. This is the beginnings. They don't know how long it's going to take. For all they knew, it would take one generation and be over. They don't know that 2,000 years later, you and I will be talking about it and trying to understand it. They don't know that there's going to be a distinctive architectural pattern for church buildings down the road. But they believe that this is a movement of God that will draw people into this movement and that it has a future, that the future is guaranteed and assured. I think they were right. They just didn't know all the details. So many interesting questions here. One is just about the nature of what the kingdom of God means. John the Baptist says, prepare you the way. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand or is within you. And so often we think of the kingdom of God as what we today might call the church. Organized congregations, maybe even a larger umbrella organization. Can you tell anciently, as you look at the actual texts of the time, what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think we do know uh, the language comes out of Isaiah, especially as it is refracted through the Aramaic paraphrase that we call the Targum. So Jesus is hearing scripture paraphrased, interpretively read and discussed in synagogues. He grows up with that. He participates in that. He preaches and teaches in synagogues himself. He speaks Aramaic. And there are key passages in the book of Isaiah where in Aramaic, reference to God or God is king, references become kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has been revealed. And this includes passages like Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of the messenger who on the hills who announces the good news that God reigns, that's connected to John the Baptist in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And so kingdom of God doesn't mean church, Kingdom of God means the rule of God. The reign of God is breaking in. It has come near, literally, is what Jesus says. And he also says the king of God is in your midst. And I know it's debatable. Does it mean in your heart or simply here among us in Israel? But the king of God is here. So what does the church do? What does Jesus' assembly, his kahal, his ecclesia, what is it tasked with? Proclaiming the kingdom, continuing Jesus' work. 
And so the kingdom of God continues to push its way forward into a world that is resistant, but the kingdom of God will eventually prevail. And it's the church's task to do this work. And that's what the church has been doing now for 2,000 years. I wonder if I could stop for just a minute and maybe switch to a very personal application of what the kingdom of God is. You apparently have grown up in a Christian family, in a Christian home, and have kept a home there and belief. I'm wondering if you can tell me your earliest intimations of belief that these were more than just teachings, that there was such a thing as a God or that this was real to you. Yeah, I was seven years old. And actually, I was a guest preacher. I actually have a vivid memory of that. That was a long time ago, but I remember it very clearly. And uh, it was like Jesus tugging on my heart. I knew I'm going to follow him. Now, of course, at that age, I didn't have any deep theological understanding. I couldn't have explained anything about the atonement. I knew that, that Jesus was important. He's the Savior. I believe in him. And I made that expression of faith to my parents and to the pastor of the church. And it was three years later, I was baptized by immersion, which I later learned, learning Greek, that is what the word baptized means, underwater, immerse. And yeah, so I have vivid recollection of that. I've been a loyal follower since. When I was in university, I wanted to go into it deeper. I had gone to university on the idea that I will go to law school and become an attorney. I was being encouraged in that direction, and the idea of legal argument, investigation, proof, evidence, that was attractive to me, but I turned it into a quest for historical knowledge of the ancient text, archaeology, the land of Israel, and so on, to confirm and clarify aspects of my own personal faith, and at the same time, make it part of my professional life as a teacher and as a scholar. And I have found it richly rewarding. Some people have said, oh, if you get into the Greek and the Hebrew, you dry out. (laughs) If it becomes too academic, you lose your faith or you lose your, how do they put it usually, your enthusiasm or your joy. And that has not been my experience. To know more accurately what Jesus taught, what it actually meant in context, when he says to the sinful woman, For example, Luke 7, your sins are forgiven. Her sins, he says to the Pharisee, which are many, have been forgiven because she's loved much. That to me is hugely, deeply meaningful. It hasn't dried me out, but has deepened my faith and a deep convictions too. I believe the faith is true, not because my parents told me or not because a Sunday school teacher or preacher said so, but because of my ongoing research and study, and I also believe in the enlightening, revelatory work of the Holy Spirit as well. You you said you used a very beautiful phrase at age seven, feeling that tug on your heart from Jesus, which I think is a very understandable phrase for someone that age. Do you still feel that tug? Oh, yes, of course. You know, it's interesting, as I've grown older and in my scholarship, I've done a lot of work on burial tradition. And you can see why. Was there really a tomb? Was Jesus really buried? There was this debate some years ago about that. Oh, is he just left hanging on a cross, eaten by dogs and all that? And so if you get into the burial tradition, you also get into the death tradition, crucifixion, death, put in a tomb, and so on. And I find myself deeply moved thinking about Jesus suffering on the cross. And, uh, you know, I'm a parent now. You know, my children are grown up. I have two grandsons. And it's like, it's almost like a fatherly instinct. I want to put my arm around Jesus and comfort him. It somehow bothers me that he suffered so on the cross. It ticks me off. <laughs> I, find I had not thought that way when I was younger as a younger Christian. But as an older person, I guess it just bothers me for him to be slapped around. It's like I want to run to him and say, listen, it's going to be okay. Trust me, it's going to be okay. It's a funny feeling that's in me. So that's just, I guess, development in faith and life, but informed very much by my scholarship. Well, there is the precedent for the Father sending an angel to comfort him. So you're having a a very scriptural impulse, I think. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I'd like to join the angels and lend a hand. (laughs) You're listening to In Good Faith. We'll be right back. Welcome. 
Welcome back to In Good Faith. You've already addressed something that I was leading to, which is what connects you to the divine and makes that be an active power in your life. But you just mentioned that your scholarship really is part of that. Yeah, that's right. I've given a lot of thought to what it means to be a human being. What does it mean to learn, to acquire knowledge? And we acquire knowledge in a lot of ways. It isn't simply mathematical, logic, data, information, crunching the numbers, and we say, okay, these are facts. There is also an intuitive element, what it means to know faith things, how God speaks to people. We are spiritual people. We are made in the image of God, so we shouldn't be surprised if people have spiritual experiences, which includes intuition. Now, I know people can make mistakes. People can get the wrong message, and that's why it is good to have objective study, evidences, facts, as it were, that we all together can look at and handle ourselves, documents and artifacts on the table in front of us, so that we're not just guided by personal experience and intuition. But I think the two sides go together. How do you perceive, as you mentioned it, that God speaks to us through intuition? Maybe that is how the Holy Spirit speaks to you personally, is that is your experience. Through intuition. Yeah, that's right. I do think that, but I would, but if if I sense God telling me something or leading me something, I don't think that's on par with Scripture. I'm not going to write it down and say, okay, we just let's add my notes to Paul's letters. Thus saith Doctor Evans. Yeah, no, yeah, and, I, and I'm not going to write the Bible. Uh, one time I wrote a letter to comfort my dad, and he wrote back and he said, oh, he just loved it. He says I regard it as Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that can't happen. But I don't regard my opinions as scripture. But I do think that if there were more than just physical matter, and it's more than just physical evidence. There are other elements that come into play. And so combined and collectively, it's not just me and how I assess everything. It's you. It's other colleagues with expertise. We study together. We learn from one another. So learning is also a community project. God does give us direction, and yet so often the direction seems to be a a lot of it left up to us. Go organize yourselves, but how? And then we try and work out how. Could you comment on the fact that whatever Jesus meant, whether it was establishing a spiritual kingdom and not necessarily a church separate from Israel that had existed in synagogues, What do you think about the way that we have divided ourselves up into denominations? I think it's a mix. There are different cultures, different languages, different experiences, different worldviews. And so a variety of denominations, a variety of expressions of how we go about worship and study together isn't a bad thing. And so that's understandable. But I think in a lot of cases, it leads to division. It leads to misunderstanding. It leads to unnecessary conflict and criticism. And that's the negative thing. Um, And I think what it does is it says, despite God's truth, despite God's redemptive, restorative work, we are still fallen human beings. And it is reflected in how we do everything. And so we see this mirrored in the church, too. And some of the denominationalism and diversity, that's okay. But sometimes I think we need a little humility and say, hey, we need ad fontes, go back to the sources and be reminded, here's what Jesus taught. This is what the apostles taught. And these are non-negotiable, but these others are open to a variety of interpretations and applications, and that's okay. And I think we'd get along a little better that way, and we would have a more united front in speaking to a world that's lost and in need of the gospel. A lot of surveys show more and more of the younger generation calling themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Often that's interpreted to mean they don't believe, but it really just means they're not adherents or identifying themselves with a particular denomination. But it seems to me that many of them are still very religious, very spiritual and very believing. Is that your experience? And what do you see for the future of this kingdom or the church? Yeah, yeah, your observation's correct. I've seen that too firsthand. 
I've been a classroom lecturer now. I'm in my 43rd year. And the loyalties to specific denominations, those loyalties have greatly diminished. And students aren't too bothered by that. You might have a Baptist and a Presbyterian and a Pentecostal, and they're all sitting next to each other. And they honestly can hardly talk intelligently about their denominational distinctives. They're not interested in that. And so they're looking for friendship. They're looking for common cause, companionship. They're looking for meaning in life. And they're impressed by Jesus. They just want understanding better. And they're not so impressed by the preacher who bangs away in the pulpit and says, our way is the only way. So I think that, I think you're right. And a lot of kids find church boring, irrelevant, of no use, and they drop out. I think that's tragic because you drop out of church. There are a lot of alternatives out there that aren't very good at all, that are destructive and harmful. And so I think what a lot of churches need to do is wake up and figure out how to be relevant again. I'm old fashioned. I still think. Uh, preaching scripture, teaching scripture, focused on the gospel, focused on the redemptive love of God is the way to go. Not TED Talks on how to have a happier marriage, but sticking closer to scriptural teaching and good theology. And I think that's relevant. I think the gospel still speaks to the human condition as effectively today as it did a long time ago. But I think churches have been caught up in a ways of doing things that were very meaningful a hundred years ago, but aren't so meaningful now. And so our young people are finding it boring and saying, oh, I, but as you just said, and you're right, they still are asking spiritual questions. They still have spiritual hunger. They are interested in faith. We just need to figure out how to speak to that more effectively. Lastly, even with those 43 years of teaching and the years of study before and during, because you've never stopped learning. That's clear from the books you've written. What do you identify as the core of your belief in God? My core is theocentric. So God exists. He is the creator. The universe didn't spring out of nothing. And that's widely acknowledged now. Uh, the Big Bang. God is the Big Bang. He, he spoke the word. He created the universe and did so in an amazing way. I'm deeply impressed by the whole story of the universe. And so for me, it's very God-centered. And then what grows out of that is the incarnation. God made himself known in a unique, special, one-of-a-kind person. That's Jesus of Nazareth, whose work is redemptive and saving. I don't know everything there is to know about that. I don't know everything. God is not somebody who you can study and analyze and dissect. So there's a mystery to God. There's a mystery to the incarnation. But I believe God has God loves us. He made us in his image, and he has acted redempt, redemptively to restore us. And that's the heart at, at the very center of my belief. And I believe God can be trusted. And that's where faith comes from. Faith is saying, I trust God. I believe in him. I may not understand everything and life may not be perfect and there may be sorrow and reverses that take place in my life or in the lives of family and loved ones, but I still trust God because I believe he's acted redempt redemptively in his son. And so I trust him for that. We were just speaking with Professor Craig Evans, author of From Jesus to Church, and I thought it was a really helpful discussion, personally. One thing that stood out to me, he just talked about how he can't really dissect God, who he is. Sometimes we really want to be able to break things down, especially um, in this scientific kind of world that we live in. But for him, it's more of a relational thing that he just trusts God, and that's what grounds him. Because even though he's an academic scholar, and that is something that he cares about, he also acknowledges that there are other ways that we come to know and we learn. Yeah, and he called it intuitive knowledge. Uh, I might call it a spiritual, spiritual knowledge, for instance. But the whole idea that as much study as he has done, for him that hasn't pulled him away from what he calls his intuitive knowledge, there is something in him that just knows that existence or that presence of God in his life. I like hearing that. I love the Bible. I was raised reading the Bible with my grandmother and my mother. 
And to have two people bring to me something new that I could learn that would help me as I read the Bible yet again, that's just super exciting. That makes everything feel fresh. And with with Dr. Evans, that is about this idea. I think as Protestants, we often sort of leap over (laughs) um, in our understanding of the Bible that Jesus came to the Jews, right? And that, in fact, he is very interested in saving and restoring and redeeming and uh, helping the Jews. And I think often we just sort of say, oh, they didn't want it, and so it's ours now, uh, which is not necessarily the truth at all. Um, If we look at all the leadership of the early church, they were all Jewish folks who had converted. So, yeah, I just am really excited about thinking about these ideas as I open the Bible again. I think along with that, he talked about how Scripture can change meaning throughout the course of your life. As he transitioned into fatherhood, he talks about how he changed into this mindset of wanting to comfort Jesus. He says, I wanted to put my arms around him and comfort him. And I think that's a beautiful testament that Scripture can change meaning in our personal lives over time. So— Any of us could pick up a book of Scripture. There are any number of translations of the Bible from the King James with its language to the most recent, I think, one of the new NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. And there's the Oxford translation that I love that's thick enough that I could use it to hold open a a door. I don't do that, (laughs) but I could, which has every verse has a little commentary on what each thing means. Uh, Heather, what you said about learning something new about something that is a big part of your life anyway, is quite exciting. So I hope if you've been listening today that you feel like your preconceptions or what you thought was maybe even set in stone got shaken up just a little bit. I think that's good for us to open us up to spiritual exploration. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team also includes Emma Ingerbretson, Leah King, Tanya Lockett, and Katerina Martinich. Our sound designers include Joshua Foots, Dallin Jepson, Daniel Phillips, Mitchell Towsley, and Carly Wilson. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, We think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If you enjoy the show, be sure and leave a comment or review where you get your podcasts and help spread the word. You can find us on Twitter at InGoodFaithPod and on Instagram and Facebook at InGoodFaithPodcast. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. But wait, there's more. (laughs) If you are one of our podcast listeners, here's a little exclusive that's just coming to you, which is Dr. Elizabeth Pulser. We had such an interesting, intriguing conversation with her that there's a little we didn't have time for that we want to be sure you get to hear right now. I know that some people are always like, isn't Mary from Magdala? So how could she be Mary of Bethany? And then there's the Mary the Tower thing. So what do you think? Yeah, I have been to the site um, in Israel that's called Migdal today. And I know that a lot of people say, wait, Mary Magdalene is from Magdala. That's what her name means. Well, it turns out that that particular location by the Sea of Galilee um, that is today called Migdal and definitely has some first century synagogues in it. Um, Pretty spectacular. Th- Yeah, it is spectacular, but there is no evidence that it was called Magdala at the time of Jesus, none. Um, In fact, there's a lot more evidence to suggest that it was called Terakea because uh, Josephus and Pliny and several historians know this town. It is, you know, it's in Galilee. It's it's well-established, and there would definitely have been lots of synagogues there at that time. So why do people tie it to Mary Magdalene? Well, um, in 2021, I published an article with Professor Joan Taylor in the Journal of Biblical Literature, and we basically showed that nobody ever said that Mary Magdalene came from that location until the 6th century. And in some ways, it seems to have been sort of invented as a location to venerate her, because um, in the West, most people thought that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. But in the East, 
people thought that Mary of Bethany was not Mary Magdalene. So they needed a pilgrimage site for her. And so there's a place in Matthew 15, 39. If you look at a King James Bible, it says they came to the shores of Magdala. And you're like, there was a Magdala in the first century. But I'd say, are you looking at a King James Bible? Because only later manuscripts have the word Magdala in Matthew 15, 39. All of the oldest manuscripts call that location by the Sea of Galilee, Magadon. Interesting. But perhaps because the word is so similar, it got tweaked in the manuscripts. Magadon became Magdala, and then you have Mary's hometown, and then you can build a pilgrimage site there. So what we basically argued is that that, that site that's so beautiful in Israel is actually probably Terake. And it is possible that Mary Magdalene came from Bethany. The word Magdala just means tower. And in that case, it would be a nickname for her. So just as Peter is the rock, it's possible that Mary of Bethany was given the nickname the tower. Interesting. Mary the like, tower S. Like a tower of strength, perhaps, or something like that. Yes. That is one possibility of the meaning of her name. It could reference a place that she's from, or maybe not. It could be an indication that she's one of Jesus' closest closer disciples because he gave titles to a lot of his disciples. So we're just opening up that possibility that Mary of Bethany was the same person as Mary Magdalene and that she got this title. So when you say Mary of Magdala, you're sort of doing an interpretation in translation that may not, this is about accuracy in translation because <laughs> you're foreclosing other possibilities where the name can mean more than one thing. 